The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The Equitable Life Assurance Society is a great mutual institution organized to serve Americans and America. Therefore, one of the Equitable Society's major objectives is to make all possible contributions to the welfare and stability of American business, on which so many of the Equitable Society's four million members depend for their livelihood. Tonight's middle commercial is addressed to the man who owns his own business. For such an owner, this commercial, due in about 14 minutes, will have information of great importance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Unwilling Draft Dodger. There's a well-known method used by psychiatrists and psychologists for probing the inner recesses of the human mind, called the word association test. In application, the examiner mentions a word, and you answer quickly with the first word that comes to your mind. When the word color is given, the answer in most cases is red. When the word number is mentioned, the majority answer seven. And when the key word used is crime... The answer is usually gun. But there are many crimes committed every day in the United States in which no gun is involved. One of these crimes, and this is probably the most heinous crime that can be committed, is perpetrated by those parents who not only fail to instill in their children a respect for law and order, but who, on the contrary, teach them that laws were made to apply to everyone else, but not to them. That child may become a juvenile delinquent, and if by some chance he escapes that fate, then he is certain to grow up and become an adult delinquent, a person who tries to contribute less to society than he takes from it. Adult delinquent is a pleasant substitute for the harsher word which better describes the future career of any child so taught. That word, criminal. Tonight's file opens in a building located in the downtown district of a large eastern city. In a richly furnished private office in this building, one Charles Berwick is seated at his desk. He is greeted by his son, Peter, who has just entered the room. Hello, Dad. Hello, son. Have a chair. Uh Uh-oh. This is going to be serious. Why do you say that? Because I can always tell. Whenever you say, have a chair, it's trouble. You are very observant, son. That's a good trait in the boy. I like it. Thank you, Father. Uh, Now, what have I done? Well, this has nothing to do with your conduct. I had you meet me here in the office because I wanted to have a man-to-man talk with you. All right, sir. You're 19 years old now, Peter. And since the day you were born, I've carefully supervised every step you've taken. Yes, sir. Since you've been old enough to walk, I've been grooming you to come into the business with me. And ultimately, of course, to have you take my place as head of the firm. Well, I'll do the best I can, sir. Peter, I want you to come into the business immediately. But... Uh, Father, I'll be... I know you're going to tell me that you have to serve two years in the Army. That's right. I report in two weeks for my physical. Peter, I'd like to ask a favor of you. What, Dad? I don't want you to go into the Army. But, (laughs) Dad, I don't have much to say about that. Son, I've never let circumstances govern my life before, and I'm not going to start now. I've heard of a way to fix things so you won't have to go. Huh? I'm checking into it immediately. Dr. Fairfield? That's right. I'm Mr. Berwick. Oh, please come in. Thank you. 
You'll have to excuse the appearance of my office, Mr. Burbick. I've just Doctor, been... Doctor, uh... I'd like to get right to the point of my visit. I've thought about our telephone conversation, and I've decided to place my son, Peter, in your care. That's fine. I think you've made a very wise decision. You absolutely guarantee, of course, that Peter will not be able to pass the physical examination when the army doctors go over him. Absolutely, sir. These pills I prescribe will do the job perfectly. I, uh, I'll write you out a prescription which you can get filled at any drugstore. Uh, taking this stuff won't harm Peter in any way, will it? You have my word as a doctor that it won't. Are there any other instructions? No, Mr. Berwick. That's all there is to it. Excellent. Uh, by the way, uh, you did remember to bring my fee in cash. Oh, yes. yes. I have it right here. Yes, that's fine. Now, while you're counting it out, I'll write the prescription and Peter can be on his way to, uh, ill health in the morning. Meanwhile... At the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor meets Agent Andy Wilson in the teletype room. Andy? Yeah? Andy, have you finished sending that information to Salt Lake City? Oh, yes, Jim. I was finishing just as you came in. Oh, fine. Let's walk back to my desk, huh? The SAC just assigned us to work together on a new case. All right. What kind of case is it? Conspiracy to violate the Selective Service Act. I didn't know we were starting to get them again. What's the story on this one? Well, we're looking for a man named Donald Fairfield. He poses as an ex-army doctor who can help keep wealthy boys from being drafted. Have we got anything on Fairfield? Yes, he was convicted in 1942 on the same charge. He's just been released from Leavenworth. Well, how come this officer's in on the case? Because Fairfield went into Chicago when he got out of prison, tried to sell some more pills to some well-to-do families there. Mm-hmm. One of the families complained to the police. Fairfield got wind of the complaint and skipped town before they could make the arrest. I see. A check at the airport out there showed that Fairfield had... Bought a ticket to come here. How long ago was that? About a week ago. In other words, long enough for him to have gone into action again. That's right, Andy. So if we want to catch Fairfield before he gets a chance to close any more deals, we've got to work fast. More coffee, Joan? No, thanks, Peter. I would like to dance, though. Oh, well, let's sit this one out, huh? You mind? What's the matter with you? What do you mean? You're worrying about something. Well, I am, but it's not very important. Peter, if we're going to be happy together after we're married, we've got to learn to be honest with each other. Oh, we will be happy, Joan. Not if we keep secrets from each other. Well, I'll tell you what it is. I got a card this morning telling me to report in two weeks for my army physical exam. Is that what's bothering you? Well, well, that's not... You said last week you didn't mind going in. Oh, I don't. It's... Well, my father doesn't want me to go. Oh, Peter, when will you grow up? Oh, Joan. When will you do something without your father? On your own? But he doesn't approve. He's never approved of anything for you that conflicted with his own selfish interests. All through school, he didn't approve of your playing football. He didn't approve of most of your friends. He doesn't approve of me. But my going into the army is different. You're darn right it is. For once in his life, he's run into something that he can't do anything about. Joan, he can. Huh? He has. What are you talking about? The thing that's really bothering me. You see, father has made arrangements with a doctor to help me flunk my army physical. Peter. It's up to me to decide whether I want to go through with it or not. Nobody can make anybody do what he doesn't want to do. Oh, but I... You're a grown man now, Peter, and you've got to decide now to live your own life or, or to let your father live it for you. Either you stand up to him now or we're through. Anything come in overnight on the Fairfield alarm, Jim? Not a thing, Andy. Say, how did he contact his potential victim in Chicago? I don't know. Probably he's like most other confidence men, though. I guess he uses a sucker list. Well, where would you go if you wanted to buy a list of wealthy families with sons of draft age? It's a pretty specialized list. I wouldn't know. But I've seen those lists when they were even more specialized than that. Andy, I saw one once that had the names of elderly, divorced men who had once invested in musical comedy. <laughs> Excuse me, Andy. Sure. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, sir. Yes, that's right. He did. 
Tell me, did he have any trunks? Hmm. I see. Well, thanks for calling. Yes, we'll be right up. Well, we know now that Fairfield was in town anyway. Why? Who was that? Manager of the Hotel Central. He got a copy of our flyer on Fairfield. Fairfield checked in to the Central the night he arrived here in town. How long was he there? Just overnight. He left no forwarding address. Didn't ship any trunks in the hotel, so they have no idea where he went. So near and yet so far. Well, the manager said he still had the phone slips for the day that Fairfield was there. He'd be glad to make them available to us. Good. Andy, let's go up there, see what we can find. Dr. Fairfield? Yes? I'm Peter Berwick. Oh, yes, I've been expecting you. Come in, please. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm late. That's all right. Doctor, I'd like to talk to you. All right, son. I've been thinking this whole thing over since my father told me about it. I've decided I don't want to take those pills. Oh, why not? Because I want to serve my two years in the Army. Your father will be very disappointed when he hears your decision. Yeah, I know. He'll have to pay me anyway. I'll tell you what. You charge him and I just won't take the pills. All right. Oh, that's a relief. I was sure you'd be angry. Why? Well, didn't you and Father agree on a bonus if I was rejected? That's right. Well, now you won't get it. I'll get more than that. Huh? You see, that money from your father was really only a down payment. I don't understand. I have a recording machine in this office. It automatically records all conversations I have here. Thanks to that machine, I have a record in my files of everything that was said by your father when we met yesterday. Oh. Your father can go to jail if I turn that record over to the authorities. But, doctor, you can't do that. Yes, I can. But I'm sure your father wouldn't want me to. In fact, I'm so sure that I'm going to call him and offer to sell him the record for $25,000. <laughs> We will return to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI in just a minute. Now a brief case from the official files of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, showing how equitable business insurance helps stabilize our American economic system. Names used are fictitious, but the case is an actual one. Some months ago, here was the situation which confronted Mr. Warner Walker, owner of a prosperous automobile agency in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Mr. Walker himself is speaking. Yes, ever since the war, we've been selling cars as fast as we can get them. I certainly have no complaints the way my business is going. Well, let me ask you this. What would happen if your business got wiped out by fire? Why, I carry fire insurance, of course. Plenty of it. In other words, fire couldn't wipe out your business. But your death could, since you're the sole owner. Actually, at your age, you look about 40... The hazard your business faces from your death is 13 times greater than the hazard of fire. Is your business insured against that much greater risk? No, it isn't. I never thought of it before. You see, if you die without a will, the law will force your executor to liquidate your business at a big loss if necessary. And even if you do leave a will, the need to raise cash to settle your estate might force a liquidation anyway. That's why I suggest that you see an equitable society business insurance specialist right away. Well, what would his solution be? Enough business insurance to reimburse your family for the depreciation in the value of your business due to the loss of its biggest asset, you. In other words, enough cash to eliminate any need for a forced liquidation. So why not talk it over with a business insurance specialist from the Equitable Society? He's fully qualified by experience and training to work out a plan that's sound in every detail and tailor-made for your business. Call the nearest equitable office and ask for the manager. Or write a brief note, care of this station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Unwilling Draft Dodger. In connection with tonight's case from the files of your FBI, we bring you a message from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Addressing you, the listeners of this program, Mr. Hoover says, and I quote, 
When the president, on September 16, 1940, signed the Selective Training and Service Act, a tremendous task was placed on the shoulders of the FBI. We were able to discharge our obligations under this law only through the untiring efforts and unselfish devotion to duty on the part of the thousands of America's peace officers. Their splendid cooperation was symbolic of the united effort which made victory possible. The president, on June 24, 1948, approved a new Selective Service Act, and the FBI has again been charged with the responsibility to investigate violations. We undertake this new task with a deep sense of public responsibility and with the hope that the ends of justice will be properly served. Tonight's case continues in a local FBI field office. Jim, I checked every one of those numbers Fairfield called while he was at the Hotel Central. Oh, good, eh? They're all real estate firms, all seven of them. I imagine it's too late now for any of them to be open, huh? It is. I tried them. None of the phones answered. No. Anything come in on the alarm? No, but we have a trifle more to work with now. I called Fairfield's prospective victim in Chicago a little while ago. Could he give you anything else? Well, nothing direct, but he did tell me what Fairfield charges. That must be an interesting number. Yes, it is. It's $7,500, and he demands one-third of it in cash when he delivers the prescription. It's a lot of cash, Jim. Yeah, Andy, I was thinking about that. I, I think I may have a way of finding Fairfield's customers. How? Well, very few legitimate people keep $2,500 in cash anywhere but in a bank. That's right. So tomorrow morning, will you check those real estate brokers, see if Fairfield has rented anything through them? Sure. I'm going to check the banks and try and interview anybody who's withdrawn $2,500 in cash. <laughs> Taylor? That's right. I'm Mr. Berwick. You wanted to see me? Yes, sir. I'm a special agent of the FBI. I know. My secretary told me. Here are my credentials. I see. What can I do for you? Well, I'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Not at all. Mr. Berwick, do you have any children? Yes, I have a fine boy. His name is Peter. How old is he? Nineteen, last month. Oh, I see. I'm sure Peter hasn't done anything that could possibly warrant no, no, you. No, 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 sir. I, I didn't come here to talk to you about that. In checking at your bank, Mr. Berwick, I learned that you withdrew $2,500 in cash this week. If you don't mind my saying so, I think it's rather presumptuous of you to go through my bank account without my knowledge. Well, the bank was merely complying with subpoena to furnish us with a list of names of people who had made withdrawals of $2,500 or more in cash during this past week. We have made no other investigation into your bank account, sir. I see. Now, Mr. Berwick, would you mind telling me why you withdrew that amount in cash? Not at all. I play in a rather large table stakes poker game every week, and we play for cash. Does that clear the matter up for you? Oh, I believe so, yes. Is that all the information you wanted? That's all. Well, if there's ever anything else you want to know, don't hesitate to call on me. We won't, Mr. Burley. I got here as soon as I could. Joan, I'm in terrible trouble. With the doctor? Yeah. What happened? I went there. Told him I didn't want to go through with it. That doesn't make any difference to him. Why not? Because he's going to blackmail my father. What? He's got a recording of the conversation father had with him. Oh. If he turns it over to the police, well, a thing like this can ruin him. Not if your father goes to the police first and tells them everything. He'd never do that. Maybe the doctor was only trying to scare you. Maybe he really doesn't have that record. I'm convinced that he has. Joan, there's only one thing to do. What? Pay another call on Dr. Fairfield. With a gun. Jim, I may have the break we've been looking for. Good work, Andy. I checked every one of those real estate offices that Fairfield called, and they all remembered his calls. Any of them rent him an apartment or a house? Six of the seven said no. How about the last one? Well, that's the Jack Hupp Company, Jim, and they told me that the salesman who handled the Fairfield call was out showing a house. They have him call here. Good. Did you get anything? Yes, I checked with all the banks. I learned that three men had made a single withdrawal of $2,500 one time this week. I saw all three of them. What did you get? 
Two blanks, but the third man, a Mr. Charles Berwick, said he had made a withdrawal to play poker with. Oh, it could have been true, but somehow I felt he was worthy of further investigation. So? Well, he told me he had a 19-year-old son. So I looked into Mr. Berwick's background, including who his doctor was, where he had his prescriptions filled. Prescriptions? Well, yes, that's the most important part of Fairfield's racket, the prescription he gives, don't you remember? Oh, sure. Well, I went to every drugstore in Berwick's neighborhood. I learned that he brought a prescription into a pharmacy at 11th and Oak yesterday afternoon. Who was the doctor? Well, the signature was quite illegible, but I believe it could very easily have been Dr. Fairfield. Did you confront Berwick with this evidence? Not yet. I came right back to the office with the prescription. I had it sent to the lab to see what they could get on the signature and the ingredients prescribed. I'll get it in. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, yes, just a moment, Andy. It's for you. Oh, thanks, Jim. Hello? Yes. You did? Fine. Uh huh. Uh, right. Thanks very much for calling. Bye. Well, number seven was a lucky number, Jim. No. That was the salesman from the seventh real estate office Fairfield called. He rented Fairfield an apartment at 21 Jackson Avenue. Good work, Andy. Let's get over there. Hello, Dr. Fairfield. Oh, no, oh, it's you. Oh, come in. Thank you. Well, have you changed your mind about going into the Army? No. I came back here to ask you not to blackmail my father. My dear boy, that's a large favor. I want you to give me that recording you made the day my father came here. I'm sorry, son. That would be impossible. If you won't give it to me, I'll have to take it. Now, look. Put away that gun. Not until you give me the record. It, uh, it's not here. It's in a vault. I don't believe you. Open that filing cabinet. Put on that gun. Huh? It's all right, Jim. I've got it. Now, now look, look, I... Have... Rest. Andy, throw the cuffs on. Here. Right, Jim. Just who are you and how did you get in we're here? We're special agents of the FBI. We were led in here by the superintendent after we showed him their warrant for your arrest. You're arresting him? That's right. What's your name, young man? Peter Berwick. Are you the son of Mr. Charles Berwick? Uh, yes, sir. Then you'd better come along with us. That's right. My name is Joan Parma. Miss Parma? I went to the police station to tell them about a Dr. Fairfield, and they sent me up here to see you. Do you know Fairfield? No, sir. But the man at the police station told me that you arrested the doctor and a, and a boy named Peter Berwick. Yes, that's right. Where is Peter? The special Agent Wilson is interviewing him in the next room. He's innocent, Mr. Taylor. How do you know? He, he told me all about Dr. Fairfield. Well, exactly what did he tell you? That he didn't want to take the pills, but the doctor had a recording that he wanted to use to blackmail Peter's father. Uh, in the first place, Miss Palmer, let's refer to Fairfield as mister. He's no more a doctor than I am. I see. In the second place, Peter Berwick has told me all about the recording. And if it does exist, then it will merely serve to prove what we already know. That his father went to Fairfield so that he could evade military service. But he never agreed to take the pills. He only went up to the office oh, yes, to get... Dear. Yes, sir. Peter. Sure. He hasn't changed the story, Jim. No. I'm going out to the front desk. It seems we have another visitor. Okay, Andy. Peter, I've been trying to tell Mr. Taylor that you're innocent, but he doesn't seem to believe me. Oh, Miss Farmer, in the face of all the evidence, wouldn't you say that it's rather difficult for me to accept his innocence? But you found me in the office with a gun. That's when I went up there to get the record back. Oh, I'll grant that the circumstance of finding you in Fairfield's office with a gun mitigates in your favor. It proves that what I said is true about Peter not wanting to take the pill. But it hardly explains away the $2,500 cash withdrawal from his father's account or the prescription for the pills. Thank you. Mr. Taylor, what's this I hear about my son being under arrest? That's correct, Mr. Berwick. He's under arrest. And you are, too. What for? Suspicion of conspiracy to violate the National Selective Service Act. Oh, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Now, you release my son immediately if you know what's good for you. I won't have you intimidating me or any member of my family. I'll have J. Edgar Hooper on the phone in five minutes to have your job unless Peter's released and released immediately. I'm a Mr. member of... Mr. Berwick, it's not that I'm not interested in what you're saying, but I have to answer this. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, I'll talk to you in a couple of minutes. Mr. Berwick, that was one of the special agents searching through Mr. Fairfield's apartment. He just played the record that Fairfield made of your conversation with him. What record? Mr. Fairfield made a recording of his conversation with you, Father... He made it that first day you went there. Uh, I refuse to discuss this any further until I speak with my lawyer. You're entitled to that privilege, Mr. Berwick. And, Peter, don't say another thing to this man or anyone else until I tell you to. But why shouldn't he, Mr. Berwick? 
He's innocent. You're the one who's guilty. You stay out of this and leave my son alone. First Legend Taylor. He did? Fine. All right, wrap them both up and bring them in. Oh, Mr. Berwick. Yes? When you call your lawyer, tell him that he's only got one client in this case. Your son is no longer under arrest. Oh. And why not? Because he was telling us the truth when he said that he changed his mind and wanted to go into the army. Oh, I told you, Mr. Taylor. Yes, yes, you did, Miss Palmer, but we had to have some proof. We just got it. The special agent who called found the recording that Fairfield unintentionally made of young Berwick's first visit to his office. Well, I'm... I'm free. That's right, son. You can go any time you like. Peter, you're not going to leave me here, are you? Oh, yes, Father. I'll write to you from wherever the army sends me. The bogus Dr. Fairfield was convicted for violation of the Selective Service Act and sentenced for a long term in a federal prison. Charles Berwick pleaded guilty... And even though the court was convinced he had found the error of his ways, he was given one year in jail. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was closed and closed successfully because Special Agent Jim Taylor knew that time was an important factor. In spite of the fact that they were under the constant pressure of haste, tonight's case is an example of the speed with which your FBI can carry on a painstakingly thorough investigation. In a period of 60 hours... Two special agents interviewed an intended victim in Chicago, the manager of the Hotel Central, the staffs of seven real estate offices, the tellers at every bank in the city, the three men who had made large cash withdrawals, and also every pharmacy clerk at the 11 drugstores within a one-mile radius of Charles Berwick's home. Of such hard work is a conviction born. A conviction which helps maintain a record that gives your FBI great pride. A record which shows that more than 97% of all people arrested by special agents, after being given a fair trial in a court of law, are found guilty of the crime as charged. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word about business insurance. The reason why the Equitable Society emphasizes this type of insurance is very simple. The brains and experience responsible for the success of a business enterprise have a cash value and should therefore be protected by insurance like any other valuable asset. Equitable Society representatives have worked out plans for all types of business, from progressive corner stores and successful law partnerships to large organizations with thousands on their payroll. Plan now to enlist the invaluable help that is yours for the asking from a business insurance specialist of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The dramatic account of a manhunt that spanned two continents. Its subject, illegal entry. Its title, two tickets to nowhere. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Stein. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Two tickets to nowhere on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.